interestingly, in end of August, something changed. End of August, we could measure uh, the first time um, more bulls than bears in our sentiment survey. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from crisis to creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falkobekali, your host. Well, I thought it was time to check back in with the markets. Why? Well, we had a huge rally. Look at the US market since March 23rd. The lows, the big sell-off we saw due to COVID-19 lockdowns, we had a huge and fast rally until September 3rd. And then we saw something, well, you could call a wobble, you could call profits being taken off the table, or you could call it also a change in trends. If you think about the Nasdaq gaining about 75%, of course, people are starting to feel a little bit insecure, not only about that gain and the valuation of stocks themselves, but also what the next quarter will bring. The pandemic is not letting off and we have the icing on the cake event, of course, in November, the US election. So what are investors feeling? What are investors thinking? Are they going to turn around and perhaps now sell off because just too much valuation, too much insecurity in the market? Or are they going to continue buying as we've seen it over the last few months? So I thought, well, why not check back in with Manfred Hübner? He's the creator of the Centix Sentiment Index and we had him already on the show, so you might know him telling us something about behavioral finance, why people buy, will they buy, will they not buy, how do they feel about the markets. Manfred, so good to have you back on Mentory TV. Hello, Patricia. I'm glad to be here. Okay, now you are crucial now, and I wonder whether the sentiment you are gathering on a weekly basis of private investors, especially, as well as um, institutional investors, gives us already a little bit of a glimpse, not only about the future, let's leave that for a moment, but what has happened really in the market, the sell-off we saw uh, on the 4th of September and the 5th of September in the US markets, taking them as an example. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, b before we take a look on, on that specific episode, we should uh, go a little bit back in history and, and at least starting in, in March, the, the huge rally we started in the markets after we saw um, a panic in, in the markets due to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And since then, we see um, a big rally in the market driven by um, less fear in the market, but also driven by um, massive injections of fresh central bank money into the markets. And what was interesting in this huge episode uh, until uh, end of August was that we still saw what we call the wall of worry. We still see investors in a very pessimistic mood in the market. They were skeptic um, about um, the potential of this market. We saw improvements in economic indicators, but most of the investors think, as far as we know from our own survey, that this um, um, economic recovery will not lead to a full recovery. Uh, most investors expect uh, that we only will um, recover 75% up to 80% of, of the drop. So this all leads to um, a very unusual behavior in our data that even a, a rally of 50, 60, 70% in the market never led to uh, or, or never get uh, to a, a bullish sentiment in the market. So that was the driving force behind that. And even the seasonality um, if you look on seasonality, we know August and September are um, a little bit more dangerous months with a higher probability of corrections in the market. But even uh, August was a good month uh, for the markets because of this high pessimism. And uh, interestingly, and last time we, when I was here, we talked about this wall of worry. Interestingly, in end of August, something changed end of August, we could measure uh, the first time um, more bulls than bears in our sentiment survey. And what we also saw that investor positioning change, changes um, or changed end of August, that we have had uh, for the first time uh, a slightly over investment of investors, especially of individual investors. Mm 
Yeah, and that is an interesting one to, to really pinpoint a bit. And we prepared a uh, chart just to, just to illustrate a little bit better what you mean about that wall of worry and all of a sudden the sentiment actually turning from bearish to bullish and what happened next in the market. If you want to just go through a couple of points here on the chart. Yeah, when, when you see this chart, what, what can you see? And the blue line is our uh, sentiment index for US equities. And in gray, you see the S&P 500. And the green and red areas are areas where we say sentiment is too one-sided to be a, a risk factor if it's on the red, in the red area. And in the green area, sentiment is too pessimistic and means there is a chance for markets to recover. And you see on, in March, April this year, you see this high pessimism. Uh, it, is, uh, it was panic in the market. And since then, markets recover but you also, uh, you only fluctuate between the green area uh, of support and the zero line in the sentiment. So at, at best, even after a recovery of 50, 60%, you see that sentiment was only uh, neutral and a slight uh, correction in the market reinforces um, the pessimism in the market and, and sentiment dropped back again. And uh, on the current end of this chart, you see that we had the first time, though we had the bullish, most bullish sentiment in this whole cycle, but it is not a very bullish sentiment. It is only slightly overhang of bulls, but this slightly overhang of bulls was enough to force the market again into a, a correction. We saw it in, in the last days, but when we take the news um, value of this index, you see pessimism is, is climbing again very quickly. So uh, at the end, what we can say is, yes, we have, it's most likely that we have started some type of correction. Um, we have to think about seasonality that the September is a month where you have a high uh, pop, um, probability that you have a, a, a minus result until mid of October. Um, but the, the quick um, re-emergence of pessimism is for us a sign that the wall of worry is still intact and that uh, in, if you look further into uh, Q4, uh, we should expect uh, that it's more likely that markets will climb than fall uh, due to this um, yeah, chronic um, pessimism that's still in the market. But it is so counterintuitive. It really is. I mean, you talk about a bad pessimism and, you know, people are feeling bad and worried about the markets, yet they're putting the money in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And, and markets uh, all, always go the line of least resistance and markets never reward majority positions. So when you want to get uh, exceptional results in the market, you uh, always have to look for where's the weak point in the market, where is the majority positioned, and then to think about what can go wrong with this majority positions. And that is why markets are climbing all the way. And even after such a rally, uh, there is still potential in market, not, not because it seems rational or I cannot explain why it should be rational, but if investors are not accepting this rally and then not try to benefit from this rally, that's a typical sign uh, for further potential. Yeah, that, that is so interesting because one of the first things I learned entering the financial markets is when the taxi driver tells you to buy a stock, it's time for you to sell that stock or a market and whatever. So this overbought yeah. territory when everybody is on the same train is just overloaded and too rich. And this is when uh, smart people may exit in the market. So this is where it really makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about um, what you mentioned before, you know, the central banks pumping in money that always uh, in order to support the economy, of course, and the recovery. It always sounds the bell of potential inflation. How does that uh, map out with the investment environment? I think we, we should uh, take a little step between. Um, so what, what we found uh, very interesting is that we see a recovery in uh, our own economic indices. So most of uh, investors are um, have doubts about the economy, economic recovery. But what we see from our own data, we have published uh, yesterday our newest uh, results to our own economic index. And what we can see is uh, 
expectations are stable and, and remain positive and the current situation indices are um, climbing up. So we see some sort of recovery from very depressed levels. We are not uh, still, we are not out of recession, but when we compare this developments in our own economic index, for example, with the recovery in 2009, after the financial crisis, we see um, um, a lot of similarities uh, between 2009 and this year. And it, in 2009 also investors were very reluctant to accept this economic recovery after the, the great financial crisis. And 2010 was a year where the economy um, 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 surprised uh, on the upside and that could happen again this time. And the other effect, what we see from that is that inflation potential in the market is currently rising. Uh, on the one hand, uh, due to this economic recovery, and on the other hand, because we see so much monetary stimulus, which is in this year uh, very different from the monetary stimulus we saw in 2009. In 2009, uh, central banks tried to stabilize the financial industry and most of the um, yeah, liquidity measures we, we saw were only to stabilize the financial industry and not necessarily to target the real economy. This time it's quite different. This time most of the measurements from central banks as well as from governments are um, targ uh, try to target the real economy and to, to support the recovery of the real economy. And that means for us, that inflation potential might be much higher this time than, uh, for example, 10 years uh, before. And you showed us our thematic barometer of inflation expectations. So this index you saw here in blue shows uh, what investors expect about inflation. And uh, if inflation um, is a threat or a chance for bond markets, and you see at the end of the chart, the blue line is falling, means that there's building up inflation pressures, which mean a risk factor for bonds. So in, um, investors expect inflation to be a negative factor for bonds uh, over time, and there's uh, uh, pressure building. And that is why we expect uh, that bond markets still are no, uh, not a good place to be. Um, we have in 2019, we have a big inflection points in our terms in bond markets. Uh, 2019 was the point where the majority accepts that bonds uh, yields will stay low forever. And since then, yields go not down further anymore. So it was a big inflection point. And now we see as a new um, factor emerging, um, that points to higher inflations. And that in our terms means that the bond market is a very bad place to be. And investors should not be surprised if we see over the two or three year horizon uh, continuously climbing yields, not, not by big amounts, but uh, by small amounts, but steady amounts. Yeah, so that would also support yet again, uh, a potential continued rally in the equity markets. Um, yeah, at, at one point in time, uh, rising inf uh, yields will be a threat for, for equities, uh, at least if equities are so, um, yeah, have, have such high P's as they have in, in some areas um, like we see it today. But in the, in the first place, economic recovery as every type of normalization would be a factor that supports equities. And uh, we, we would expect that yields below 1% are completely meaningless for equities. So as long as we stay, for example, in, in Germany with, with the, the Bund yields below 1% or in the United States below 1.5%, such yields are completely meaningless um, for equity markets um, because the, there's no, this is not an alternative yield, which is interesting for equity investors to, to go out of the equity market and, and to switch into bonds.
Yeah, and let's stay a little bit with the inflation theme because inflation obviously is like the biggest threat really eating into the purchasing power of whatever assets you have, especially if they are liquid assets um, and money in general. And what about gold? I wonder, you know, I talk to um, investors and there is, yes, gold is the typical inflation hedge you would buy into. It is stable. We had a fantastic rally, even in gold, uh, hitting over 2000 US dollars per ounce. Since then, it tapered off a little bit. However, it also continues to, uh, to be an asset class that investors are going into. Is this going to continue with that inflation outlook and the bond outlook you've just given us? Yeah, we think so. Um, gold benefits directly from higher inflation. Gold benefits directly from um, uncertainty in the financial system. But uh, uh, 2019, I mentioned it before in bonds, uh, we have had a very interesting point in the bond market. It was the, the point in, in summer 2019, investors switched uh, their beliefs on the bond markets. Before all the time, there were majorities saying, oh, these yields are so low, at one point in time, they, they, they might climb and that is a danger. In 2019, we, um, we see that investors switch their belief and now uh, they believe that yields will stay for a very, very long time on, on low levels because they understood that we have uh, such an anomaly in our financial system that we cannot go back to a, a classic cycle of, of rising yields, uh, falling yields due to an economic cycle. Uh, you have to understand that the uh, US Central Bank tries to um, to raise interest rates into the economic recovery we have seen in the United States. But at one point, end of 2018, they have to stop tightening the cycle because they, they saw that it will have a very negative effect on financial markets and uh, economy. So we not come back to normality in full. And that made a huge impression of investors. And since then, since 2019, you can see it in our chart uh, um, you showed us here. It is the strategic bias. It is um, an index which shows the, the long-term stance of investors to this asset class. And you see mid of 2018, um, a huge rise in this strategic bias for the first time. And that was the starting point for this gold rally. And that has a lot to do with this change in beliefs about the bond market. And since then, uh, um, gold is now this asset class that you should have in your portfolio if you want to have a good diversification. When we look back um, to, to 20, 30 years before, then bonds were a very good portfolio um, a part of your po portfolio because we have a, a long-term downtrend in interest rates. And whenever we see problems in equity markets, falling interest rates, which means higher bond, uh, bond prices, would stabilize your portfolio. We have very good sharp ratios of, of bonds in this whole um, period. Uh, and this is now not longer the case because since 2019, the bond market rally is over, yields are now near uh, zero. And that means you, from bonds, you will not get any return. And it also means you will not get further any um, diversification benefit due to falling bond yields in, in the crisis. We saw it last time this year in March in the COVID crisis, the bond market didn't help you. If you have bonds in your portfolio, it, it doesn't reduce your risks anymore. But if you have gold in your portfolio, then you would have benefited from diversification because bond was an asset that rallied in this uh, crisis. And this is since uh, mid 2018 the case. And we expect that this will continue and you see it from this high strategic bias at the current end that this is still the case. Investors believe gold is a supporting asset class and, and we expect it to continue. 
Yeah, and of course, uh, the, the million dollar question here is, uh, it is going to continue. And I remember last time I looked at gold, um, just before it was hitting 2000, the market was expecting, you had analysts coming out, well, it can rise to 3000, 5000 US dollars an ounce because of the current environment, because of the central banks and the government splashing the markets with money because the pandemic not letting off. Is this, is this a level you see realistic or are we, are we with 2000 more or less, we are oscillating around that mark now maxed out with gold or will we see the 3000 within the year? You have first to understand beside that what I said before, we are live in a, in a world where uh, money market rates are negative. And that means holding money in your bank account costs you money. Holding gold in your uh, portfolio um, doesn't cost you a yield. Maybe it costs you a little bit of um, yeah, money because you have to put it in, 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 a, in a vault to, to, to uh, have it safe. Uh, but this is almost the same rate like what you pay in the money market. So since then, since the money market rates are such negative, gold is now an, an alternative to hold liquid uh, forms of money. Um, and what makes it very interesting uh, from the perspective of investors is that gold is outside the financial system. So if you have a problem in the financial uh, system, um, then and you have money on a bank account, you can be a victim of, of, of any problem within the financial industry. But if you uh, have gold in your um, um, treasure, then uh, it is not affected by that. And this is um, what we see from, from our um, uh, experience is that this becomes more and more an important thing for investors to have uh, some money outside the financial uh, system. And, um, and that actually really, um, if I may interject there, brings me um, to the next asset class I really would like to delve into with you, um, Manfred. And that is, you mentioned diversification. You should have gold as a diversifying part of your asset classes in your portfolio. What about cryptocurrencies? What about digital assets in general? Because again, I see in my environment, more and more people are trying it out, talking about you should have some sort of diversified portfolio, maybe a certificate, maybe a little basket in an ETF to just be in that type of asset investment class as digital currencies at the moment are being labeled. Has something changed in, during this crisis, during these sell-offs, during this uncertainty when it comes to the attitude and acceptance of digital assets? Let's stop for a minute and wrap up this first part of the interview with Manfred Hübner. We'll be back in a second. Mm -hmm. 